There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another pseudo alfresco Buddy Reads. Well, as will soon be apparent, I had Buddy Reads on the brain, but, but this is not a pseudo alfresco Buddy Reads. This is a pseudo alfresco Friday Reads, as if I needed to spell that out. Uh, just the sheer volume of books I would have had to carry to go further, farther afield. So here I am on the balcony, and I kind of like the way this gray, otherwise kind of unremarkable gray shows up on the video as a backdrop with a blouse I don't think you've seen before. Just another $10 jobby, but I think, I think I like it. I am now officially broke for the foreseeable future, so no more blouses. I have one more bargain order from about a month ago that's slowly wending its way here from China, and that, that nothing, nothing for a while. I'm, and I don't need any more blouses, and in fact, uh, pretty much a 100% moratorium on book buying for the foreseeable future. I think I have enough books to read too. And there's a library, 10 minutes walk that way. I'm not complaining too seriously here. And I don't have any personal news of any kind. I spent the week still trying to recover. I'm not gonna dwell on this nagging, low level, whatever it is. I'm just gonna go to the doctor next week and get him to fix it. But aside from that, sleeping a lot, I've just did a ton of reading and didn't have any real social events or can really go out of the house almost at all. Yesterday, I didn't get dressed. It's been a long time. I don't know if I've had a day. I can't remember the last time I've had a day where I didn't actually get out of my house coat. And it was lovely. So, <laughs> so I got all gussied up this morning for you. The things I do for you people. <laughs> I haven't ever, the closest I ever came to filming a video in my house coat was a, during a very, maybe one of my very first Tokyo vlogs where one morning, I just held the camera up and talked for five minutes wearing my robe. And nobody asked for a repeat performance of that, so... <laughs> anyway, uh, let me talk instead about Patreon. Just to tell you a couple exciting things coming up. We had our first bookish brunch, which is a benefit available to all patrons at any level. Once a month, we just have a Zoom chat talking about recent reading and whatever else we feel like talking about. The first one was a smashing success. The second one is coming up in about... Uh, I'm not sure. I think it's two weeks from tomorrow, maybe. So that's really fun. And then for the uh, mid and upper tier patrons, that's the uh, what are the, what, Story Seeker and Bibliophile Bestie tiers, our first read-along is going to be happening right at the end of this month, September, and that is Andrei Kirkov's Grey Bees. So, if you want to join in on any of that, please come and have a, have a gander at my Patreon. And with that out of the way, here's the Week in Review. I've been busy booktubing this week as well. Many years ago, in the 80s, I think it was, there was a contest by the much-loved, esteemed Canadian magazine that's no longer with us called Saturday Night. I believe I'm remembering it correctly. That it was them that had the contest. Finish this phrase as Canadian as dot dot dot. And the winning entry as Canadian as possible under the circumstances. <laughs> There's all this everyday, ordinary frittering away of time and inanely planning to do things that you've been inanely planning to do that might give your life some meaning and not doing it. And that that's a, another way to fill up the quotidian. That was a powerful part that I think a, a fast read would, would skim over. Lest I come across as if I'm telling you how to read the book, I'm going to stop telling you how to read the book. <laughs> Just focus on how I read the book, as well as a few library books that I'll treat as if I'm hauling them. Okay, Sean, you've got explained all the rules. Let's get to it. I don't remember the specifics of what tweet I saw, but here is a novel from an indie press, Confingo Publishing. I saw a tweet about it. I ordered it, came in the mail, and it's actually signed by the author. It is called The Unheard by Anne Worthington. Thank you so much for... Thank you. This. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to me ramble about <laughs> this article. Oh, I, I wasn't really listening. I was checking my phone, so. 
Now, what have I got to tell you? I've got a lot to tell you. Um, for the first time in several weeks, I have a bail to tell you about. I'm surprised I haven't been bailing. So, so uh, kind of making up for lost time today, although I only have one bail to tell you about. And then I have, I think, four books that I'm putting on hold. I'll explain the difference between those two when I get to that part. And I think I've finished three. I may amend that number as I go because, you know, math is not my strong suit. But let's just get started. This is probably going to come as a shock to some of you. I bailed on The World and All That It Holds by Alexander Heyman, which is a 2023 novel and a booktube darling. Lots of people whose tastes often overlap with mine worship this birth. Worship this birth? Worship this book. And I didn't really get along with it. It started out really good, but I found there was something affected and overly stylized. Mmm... I, uh, it's been so long since I picked it up. I decided to bail after setting it down for a month, so I, my memory is even poor. I know I feel fully justified in bailing with a proviso. <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you what the pro proviso is. Because everybody and their dog loved it, I'm going to try it in five or ten years, but it's going to be a bail until then. But I found there was way too many folktales, not enough character development, and it was too lyrical. And I mean, I often... I would say usually love lyrical writing. It's almost slipping out of its dress there. But not not in this case. It started to grate on me. So and I just didn't feel, even after getting, well, I can't remember how far I got, at least 100 pages, maybe around 100 pages, that I wasn't really getting to know the characters. I was just getting to know a lot of folk tales and really ornate sentences. And again, if I had bailed on it, Immediately upon putting it down, probably I'd have fresher things to say about why I bailed, but that's my memory of why I didn't pick it up for a month, and now it's on the bail pile, but I will try it again. In five years, I'll be 32, so in my 32nd year is probably the earliest that I'll try it. So that's my bail. What's the difference between a bail and uh, uh, putting a book on hold? I created a on-hold folder on Goodreads uh, several years ago for books that just uh, I knew that I wanted to read, but just not right now. And oftentimes it was because they didn't lend themselves to being read alongside a dozen or more other books, but that they were interesting. Just I just couldn't, for whatever reason, couldn't focus it. And with the kind of, you know, I'm now into reading around 40 books at a time. It's ridiculous, and I love it. It ain't going to change, except that it'll probably the number will probably go up. Inevitably, one or two books a year fall through the cracks when I'm reading that many books, you know, juggling that many books that you know, it's been oh, months since I picked it up and I can't remember anything about it and I know I'd have to start over again. And so here are a few that are like that. This was from Person February or Person March or People April, I believe it was. An indigenous Canadian novel, Thompson Highway's The Kiss of the First Queen. I think I got about 12 pages in. Liked what I read. Never had time to get back to it. Can't remember anything about what I read. This one is a little bit sadder for me because I connected so deeply with the first novel I read by this writer, but I am putting aside Elizabeth Barrage's Sing Me Who You Are. Love the cover. I got about 70 pages in, and I, again, I think there was like weeks-long gaps in between when I'd pick it up, and so I was having trouble keeping the characters straight, and I didn't find that I was enjoying it as much as what was the one that I loved. No, I can't remember that title of that. Here's the gif. I didn't love this one as much, at least not reading it as episodically as I had been, and now it's been four months since I picked it up. I can't remember a whole lot about it. I definitely want to give it another try. I'm expecting Elizabeth Barrage to be on that not quite top tier of my favorite writers, but just one below, and so I want to keep reading her stuff. This has just recently been reissued by the British Women's Library in a nice attractive new edition, but I'm glad I have this one with this cover. On hold, not a bail. And this gay Maori novel, Witi Ihimara's uh, The Uncle's Story. I didn't get very far in this. In fact, I lost my bookmark, but I got maybe about 60 or 75 pages in. I was quite enjoying it. Just never got back to it. It just fell through the cracks, just fell off the edges. I will definitely pick it up again. It took me this long to finally try it, and I liked it, and it's still going back on the pile to be picked up at another time. It was about a gay Maori guy and his white lover 
breaking up in the first chapter. Just after, to prove his love for his white boyfriend, the Maori gay guy comes out to his family. And that's as far as I got, and it was really good, but... You know, some books just don't stick because other books stick more, and this doesn't happen very often to me. I mean, I've got a whole bunch at once because I haven't done this in a long time, but nothing bad to say about it. Looking forward to getting back to it. Maybe as soon as, I don't know if uh, there's going to be a Skoden or an Indigenous Readathon. This one and the Thompson Highway, I might pick up then or at some, some point. And the big one that I was reluctant to put on hold because even though I haven't picked it up in 2023, I think about it because I can see it on the shelf and it's beckoning to me and I can I know that I would be able to step back into it and carry on where I left late last year but it's just taken up a space on my current reads that you know I've got new books I want to try so I will come back to it I'm looking for, it'll be the first one of any of these that I come back to I th I'm quite sure the Croatian novel Kin by Milenko Djurkovic translated from the Croatian by Russell Scott Valentino. I read half of this last year. Really enjoyed it. It's really quite a reading challenge. And I decided to put it down, not because I wasn't enjoying it, but just I thought, okay, I'll pick it up at some point. And now it's September, and I haven't picked it up this year. So I know I'll pick it up again, and I think it's going to be the one I pick up the soonest, because this one I'm not going to have to do any rereading. I mean, I might have to do some page back, paging back. I have it in ebook format for searching, which helps. But I loved it. I have not. Uh, it, it's maybe. It's maybe a bit too long. I don't think it is a bit too long. But I did need to take a break, and now it's on hold for that reason. So on to what I finished. The first one I'm not going to talk about for too long because there's a discussion video coming soon. This novel set in the former German East Africa. A historical novel called Afterlives by Abdul Razak Gurna, who was born in what was then Zanzibar, which is now part of Tanzania, and who has lived in the UK for, for decades. Um, this is my first anything by Gurna. I loved it. Uh, it. It was a tough read in terms of it was a very intellectually demanding read. I had to Google read my way th through the whole thing, and that was a joy. This was a pseudo-buddy read with Tilly of Tilly Shelf and her mom, Roz, of Scally Downing, about the books, and we had a fabulous Zoom chat about it last weekend. So the three of us will get down into the weeds on that video. Stay tuned. But I would just say I didn't know anything about that part of Africa. Absolutely nothing. I learned so much, and I don't think I even knew that it was controlled by Germany, or I didn't know anything about German colonization of Africa. So much about that in here. I had to augment what I was reading in order to f understand what I was reading about the historical detail. And that was a rich, rich experience. I think if you don't know, if you know as little as I did going in and you don't like Google reading, it might not be a book for you, but I found it really compelling. And the characters were so full-bodied. He has a really interesting style where, like, the paragraphs seemed to me as I was reading them like they were long. But now that I look at them, they weren't that long. But there is a piling on of detail after detail after detail, which to build the world and build the characters, in a certain sense, it's a plain style. But what he achieves with that is anything but plain. And exposing the impact of colonialism on his African characters' psyches and how it affects their actions and how it splits their consciousness in a certain sense. Just masterfully done. What a delight this was. And two of the shorter buddy reads that I've just started, I think, both of them last week. So books that I started and finished within a week, I think, that's right. Uh, this memoir by a deaf writer who lives in Saskatoon, Adam Pottle's voice on writing with deafness. Before I get into my impressions of the book, let me tell you about my personal connection to the book. So, and again, not without going into the weeds because I don't have the people I'm going to talk about's permission to name them in connection with this writer. But the first thing was the cover design is done by an old friend of mine that I lost touch with. This is published by the University of Regina Press, so it makes sense for me to divulge that he lives in, in uh, Regina, and he's the staff graphic artist for the University of Regina Press. And I found that out about a year ago, and I just wasn't in the right space to, to reach out and connect with him. And then it kind of fell through the cracks and then I saw that he designed this beautiful book and I looked him up again and fired off an email and we've traded several since and we're gonna meet someday nothing's planned but he sounds exactly the same he's an incredibly creative 
fun, soulful young man. I'm going to say he's young. I think he's about the same age as me. So that's young. So that was uh, something delightful that happened for me that was kind of triggered because of reading this book. The other thing is that this is a series of books called Writers on Writing that's put out by the University of Regina Press. And another one is about mystery writing and one is about indigenous storytelling. And I want those books. And the editor of this, and again, you can look it up, but I'm not going to name her, but again, because I just feel a little bit weird about talking about people that they don't know that I'm talking about them. But um, I met her at that first literary reading I went to last fall for a book launched by my former professor. And I met this, she's a writer and English professor, and we had an interesting conversation that night and nothing, you know, didn't ever see her again or really keep in touch. But I've sent her another message now that I've read this because she's the editor for this series. So I hope there's going to be even more coming out. So that was lovely. And it turns out that my friend, again, I'll just say another friend of mine, uh, has worked very closely in an academic context with Adam Pottle. So, small world. This was a buddy read with Heidi of My Reading Life, and we just finished True Biz by Sarah Novich and went directly onto this, and the pairing was absolutely fantastic. In many ways, Adam Pottle's life story mirrors a lot of things about the protagonist, one of the protagonists of True Biz, Charlie that he grew up doing his best to integrate into a hearing world and then later in life started to explore deaf culture. Um, And he writes about that with humor and with a really simple, vivid style that is easy to read and compelling. So he writes about challenges during his childhood and his secondary education and so on, the difficulty of making friends and being bullied at schools because he was partially deaf and tracing the development of the technology that helped in the classroom. For example, I'd never heard of this, but the teachers would strap on a a lapel mic and he would have headphones and he was able to hear them a lot better. But there was one embarrassing incident where the teacher went, took a bathroom break and didn't forget to take the mic off. (laughs) There were times when I think quite self with with quite a bit of self-awareness he revealed his kind of cocky maybe arrogant is too strong of a word but it was just edges to his personality that he didn't hold back from sharing and i appreciated that and then in the very next chapter showing how as a teenager he got involved with volunteering with um people with brain injury his mom was involved in that as in that volunteer work and sh- and he helped her out at least for a short time and the way he writes about that it's like oh there's so many facets to this guy he's a really interesting fellow i'm really looking forward to reading more of his stuff one of his novellas is about a bunch of different disabled characters in nazi germany and portraits of their life as they're being taken on the bus to the crematorium and that sounds really powerful i've actually ordered a copy because it was eight dollars canadian on amazon it's going to be in the mail here pretty pretty quick so that'll be the next thing i read by him he writes about how being deaf has shaped his creativity has shaped his writing and there's some literary criticism in here not all of that writing that was more of a kind of academic style worked for me but most of it was absolutely fascinating and this short little memoir, and then ending with a bit of activism that he almost kind of inadvertently made happen in Saskatoon for a local literary festival, just about brought tears to my eyes. It was so beautifully written and powerful, and, you know, I've done those kinds of activist things in my very distant past in the gay community, so maybe I connected with it for that. But he's just an utterly fascinating and very talented writer, and I want to, I'll be following his career from now on recommend this very highly. I know Heidi was able to get it in the States pretty easily, so I I think it should be easy for you to find. Voice on Writing with Deafness by Adam Pottle. Loved it! And the last one I finished, late last night, this Edna O'Brien novel, A Pagan Place from 1970. Buddy read with Sonia of an enthusiastic reader, 1970. I have to say this is almost tied for my favorite with the first in the, the Country Girls trilogy, the title novel in that trilogy, Country Girls. This one, I think it was in many ways was better. I certainly loved Country Girls and I loved this one too. 
Sonia and I agreed that there's a real evolution in her style, and she's doing some interesting things with point of view. This is told in second person. I have to admit that the second person just kind of washes over me and I don't pay any attention to it. I just naturalize all the U's to I's. Maybe it's having an effect on me that I'm not aware of, but I don't think so. I think it just has no effect whatsoever on me. But it did for Sonia, and there's lots of literary criticism about this book to, that argues why she made that choice and what it shows about, this, about the character who's telling us the story using you instead of I. That part didn't do anything for me, but that didn't matter. It didn't detract from it. The second person never detracts from my reading. I just don't care about it. The first half of the book, and Sonia really gifted me with this insight, the first half is kind of plotless. It's just a, almost a stream of consciousness about childhood. And in the second half, there's much more of a story, and the story is one of deep misogyny in the way that both the protagonist, who I think is only a preteen, she might be 14 or 15 by the end of the story, her older sister comes home from, I think, Dublin, where I think she's working, and, and she's pregnant. And then all hell breaks loose. The way the parents react is horrific, but also nuanced. And that's uh, one of the crowning achievements of this. The characters are all gray. The parents, they, they were so implicated in the horrific religious misogyny that has fucked up Ireland for millennia, not only Ireland, let's be clear, that they just victimize their daughters. And then later there's an incident with the protagonist that is just horrible to read about, again, with so much nuance because she ends up getting abused and she has a complicated reaction as with the fact that her sexuality is is budding and she's attracted to her abuser and that was explored with just so much sensitivity and nuance and the writing is just gobsmackingly good. This is the one that I will reread first, both because I was reading it with, you know, brain fog, but also because it was quite complex in the way in the structure and in the writing. If you don't want to start with Country Girl, I would start with this. Now, the novels in between, they were good. I loved them, or I really liked them, but I have a prejudice when it comes to writers who come from a place. I don't want them to write about other places. Probably Edna O'Brien at this point in her life, she's, what, 90-something, three, four? She's probably lived in London for longer than she ever lived in Ireland, but I'm m most interested in her Irish stuff, and this is a quintessentially Irish novel. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Oh, and don't read, I don't know what's on the Goodreads synopsis, but the synopsis on the back here, I won't read it out, because it's a spoiler, and it's it's going to shape the way you read it, and it's going to confuse you, because the, the, the stuff it talks about in the first sentence of the synopsis, you don't really find out until the last five pages. So what is stupid, I just think there should be no synopses on the back of books. None! Just two or three words. How's that for a controversial opinion? Ban all synopses. You don't need them. They just screw you up. And I never read them either, but I made the mistake of reading this, and it's, it did really kind of throw a bit of a monkey wrench into the way that I read the book. So don't read synopses at all, people, but certainly don't read this one. Do read A Pagan Place by Edna O'Brien. It's one of her very best. All right, so that's what I finished. I'm going to start three. Two of them are for Shorty September. One of them is for Straya September. But I'm probably get, not going to get make very much progress because I have some books that are 300 plus pages that I'm doing pseudo buddy reads. I think two plus one that's got to go back to the library by Wednesday of next week. So I'm not going to be. I think three. I think three that I've promised for various points in September plus the gray bees for the end of September <laughs> plus a library book that's got to go back this Wednesday. So I don't know how much I'm going to dip into these, but I'm still excited to start them. So, and if that wasn't confusing enough, after I finished recording the video, I realized I'd left out one of the more important books I'm planning to start in the coming week. Pearl by Sean Hughes. It's on the Booker Long List. I'm buddy reading it, pseudo buddy reading it, with Alex Kerner. And we're doing that fairly early in September. So that's also going to be in progress in the coming week. This lesbian novel, Dot and Ralphie, by Amy Hoffman. You can 
hear me read the, inter the opening sentence in the TBR video, and this one sounds like it's going to be kind of a lesbian Barbara Pimian scream. And this quirky collection of essays about 20th century women writers. Mary McCarthy, Agatha Christie, Virginia Woolf, and so on. These particular women by Cat Meads. Eager to get started on that. Those two are library books, so that's another reason I'm getting going with them. And from my Straya September TBR, this collection of gay male short fiction and exciting and vivid inner life by Paul Della Rosa. So that is what's going on. What's going on with you? Thanks for watching.